Welcome to this tutorial series on the marching cubes algorithm and on periodic minimal surfaces. It's both, using one to explore the other. Some of the most really amazing and powerful features of computational design, especially when it's combined with biomimicry, is the ability to let our designs adapt to the environments we want them to live in. In some cases, this means letting them find their own form. So I find myself now wanting to fork into two different directions. I don't really know what to I don't really know what to go into first. I want to mention that minimal surfaces are pretty literally surfaces that find their own form. They just relax into these beautiful shapes. But I should also address a pretty glaring question that might come up. What does it mean to model an environment? And what does it mean to let our designs adapt to it, an environment? What does that even mean? If our designs are reflections of their environment, what are they reflecting? Maybe it's a pretty thing to say, but how do we actually make this tangible? So it's a fun place to explore. There are countless ways to actually do this, to interpret this. And there's so much potential for creativity when thinking about new ways to explore these questions. But examples are always helpful to get started. And the marching cubes algorithm gives us a pretty easy to understand and a pretty elegant example. So for us, it's a really nice way to visualize data, three-dimensional data, or to make geometry, or to change geometry. It's a really nice way, if we have a bunch of points in space, or a bunch of data points, to just make a surface out of those points, or to make something out of those points. There's always more to an environment than what we see, so we can imagine these data points being just about anything, chemical concentrations, temperatures, fluid velocities at different points, and the rhythms through which these features present themselves. So in this tutorial, we're going to bring together these two different things. We're going to learn the marching cubes algorithm, this way that we make sense of a three-dimensional space. And two, we're going to explore periodic minimal surfaces. Specifically, we're going to model some triply periodic minimal surfaces. Probably the most familiar minimal surfaces in architecture are in tensile structures. We'll look at these briefly a little bit later. For now though, let's just define what is a minimal surface. This is basically just the surface that has the smallest possible surface area that spans a boundary. So imagine you have a ring, like a metal coat hanger or something curled into a ring, and that ring is going to be our boundary. The minimal surface for this boundary will just be a flat surface on the same plane as that ring, if that ring is just a circle. But if you twist or bend the wire, the surface won't be flat anymore. So you can imagine a stretchy fabric or a soap film that's attached to this boundary. The form that that takes will be a minimal surface. Minimal surfaces are found all over the place in nature. This saddle shape just happens to be the shape of the punching mechanism of the mantis shrimp. If you want to learn more about this super fast little shrimp, you should watch this TED Talk called Measuring the Fastest Animal on Earth. It's fascinating, and there's way more to it than you might expect. But at its core is this minimal surface. So looking back at these surfaces, this is the, the smallest surface area within this boundary. And even though these surfaces have curvature, obviously they're curved a little bit, the mean curvature at any point is zero. So if the curvature in one direction is positive, then the curvature in the other direction is the same magnitude but negative. So the curvatures cancel each other out at every point. And mathematically, minimal surfaces don't actually have to be bounded at all. The ones we're exploring today are triply periodic. This means that as we move in any direction along any of the three dimensional axes in the x direction or the y direction or the z direction, they repeat themselves over and over. They're periodic. They're exactly the same no matter where we look. And so if one of the defining principles of a minimal surface is that it has the minimum surface area within a defined boundary, what does that even mean if there are no boundaries? If the surface is infinite, Basically, it means that you can imagine drawing one of these warped rings. Just look at a section of this surface anywhere. And no matter what boundary you define, the surface area will be minimal in there. And importantly, the mean curvature everywhere on these surfaces is zero. So again, minimal surfaces appear somewhat frequently in the natural world in both living and non-living systems. Triply periodic minimal surfaces have been discovered in several organisms, and that list continues to grow. If we're thinking about them from the perspective of biomimetic design, then these facts suggest a couple of things. First, because they appear in many different organisms and they seem to be serving a variety of different purposes, then they likely have some very beneficial properties that designers would want to notice and emulate. And beyond that, the diversity of their roles in different organisms suggests that there's promise in multifunctional design when employing these services or when basing a design on the lessons learned from these services. 
And there's also promise in self-assembly, since minimal surfaces appear spontaneously, even in non-living systems. And of course, the reason evolution has favored them probably comes from a combination of these observations. Evolution collects forms, processes, and relationships that, thanks to the physical interactions of the materials or substances involved, tend to emerge spontaneously, and it combines them in ever-increasingly complex ways, ways that elicit multifunctionality and ultimately benefit life in a given environment. And the marching cubes algorithm is a really nice intersection of computer logic and biological logic. It's definitely closer to computer logic side, but we can use this to visualize environments and we can use this to model the form of a wide array of living structures. And of course, particularly useful for us today is the fact that the marching cube algorithm can be really helpful in visualizing periodic minimal surfaces. These beautiful surfaces that are so often examples of, quote, beautiful math in nature. In the book Math Art, for example, on page 52, there's a sculpture by Bathsheba Grossman called Gyroid. This is a periodic minimal surface that appears frequently in nature, frequently in living systems, discovered in the 1960s by Alan Schoen. It's in butterfly wings where it produces structural color. This is color that emerges from the shape itself by bending light, also in bird wings. Also, it's very likely that it's performing a different optical function in tree shrews. This paper by Gon, Turner, and Gu, published in Applied Optics, presents some possible biomimetic applications for the gyroid structure in photonics and for optical materials. Again, just understanding how evolution has used these structures, these mathematical structures, can give us insight into the way the world works, into mathematical principles, and into optics in this case specifically. But getting back to our tutorial today, these triply periodic minimal surfaces are a great way to explore modeling programs. They're a great way to explore advanced three-dimensional modeling techniques. These surfaces just happen to be periodic in the three dimensions that we're familiar with, in the three orthogonal directions. It's crazy. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this intro, these surfaces just happen to settle into these beautiful shapes as each part of the whole, each molecule, as is often the case, interacts with its immediate environment. As it engages with the molecules around it, these shapes emerge, and as they do, they're giving us clues about the physical entanglements characterizing the space. Oftentimes, this is the result of a surfactant. Surfactant is short for surface active agent. Surfactants are often found between two different materials or two different phases, like a liquid and a gas. Their molecular structure is both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. This means part of it is attracted to water and the other part repels water. And this is what creates the surface boundary between two distinct volumes. Normally, since water molecules are attracted to other water molecules at the boundary between water and air, for example, water molecules on the surface are pulled more in one direction than in the other more toward the other water molecules than in the direction of the air, and this creates a higher surface tension. This is why water droplets beat up when it seems like a liquid like that would just let gravity spread it across the surface. But surfactants want to be at that boundary between water and air, if water and air is our example, and when they're there, this extra surface tension isn't there. With this more balanced boundary, the surface itself can just focus on getting small as the primary way to dissipate excess energy. Surface tension specifically refers to how much work or energy is associated with changing the area of a surface. There's energy embodied in a surface. Surfaces cost energy. If we decrease the surface area, then we are decreasing that potential energy, and physical systems want to decrease their total potential energy. For architects or designers, as well as in evolution, minimizing area can be associated with minimizing material and conserving resources. And this might sound paradoxical, but if we're looking at triply periodic minimal surfaces, they can actually be an excellent way to increase surface area while maintaining the structural efficiency from the minimal surface and from the form's repetition. And of course, remember that a porous structure uses less material than a solid one. So if you're 3D printing something like a building component, this can be a nice way to create a lightweight one with less material that's also strong, a lot of potential for multifunctionality. There are lots of reasons you might want to increase the surface area for something, but it's in porous materials specifically where triply periodic minimal surfaces can help us a lot. Sometimes in architecture, and extremely often in living materials, porosity is advantageous. And with additive manufacturing, 3D printing, using triply periodic minimal surfaces as our guide, we can precisely design the pores for porous materials. Triply periodic minimal surfaces just happen to be great designs for these pores. 
and we can use these to design for temperature regulation, to absorb shocks, energy absorption, and for gas exchange. But let's get back to the physical interactions at play as minimal surfaces find themselves. Here's a quote from Philip Ball discussing minimal surfaces minimizing their surface area. This is on page 35 in his book Self-Made Tapestry, a quick definition of periodic minimal surfaces. Something that defines these minimal surfaces in the real world is that there's equal pressure on both sides. In this quote, we can see the relationship between curvature and an imbalance in pressure. Wherever there's an imbalance in pressure, curvature arises. But in minimal surfaces, because the pressure is always equal on both sides, the mean curvature is always zero. And so what implications does this have for computational design? Let's look at this quote here. This is pointing us toward a more equal sharing of stress across the whole surface. This comes from both the nature of the curvature and what is pointed out here, the periodicity, the physical iteration between the modules. The constant curvature spreads the forces from any load across a broader area, and the fact that they're periodic in every direction means that this is equally true no matter where on the surface a force is applied. And so we have, inherent in these structures, the ability to distribute stress more uniformly. And also, of course, inherent in this definition, the minimal part, minimal surfaces, were minimizing the material to achieve this. And no doubt this was part of the inspiration for Frey Otto to look into things like soap bubbles for their potential in informing architectural structures, membranes for architecture, tensile structures. Frey Otto started the Institute of Lightweight Structures and SFB 230 at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. His research has had a major impact on the field of architecture. At Stuttgart, he brought together experts in different fields, scientists, biologists, engineers, and building professionals, and the research he started leads directly to the field of biomimetics in architecture today. Today, ICD, the Institute of Computational Design and Construction, is a descendant of these multidisciplinary collaborations. The ICD and the related research institutes at Stuttgart are among the most, if not the most, prestigious research institutes for computational design and for biomimicry and architecture. So in the real world, when we think about materials computing their own form, in the case of periodic minimal surfaces, they are computing their own form by finding the lowest energy state that they can. They're doing this by minimizing surface tension, and this has the effect of minimizing surface area. These materials are relaxing into these beautiful shapes. In doing so, they're revealing information about these three-dimensional spaces. And when we're going through this tutorial in Grasshopper, there will be a point where we're just going to let the mesh relax and find its own shape. We're going to use the smooth mesh component and let it pull out or smooth out any bumps, bulges, or irregularities and thereby minimize its own surface area. We're going to explore a lot of different minimal surfaces like the D surface or diamond. It's found in leaf membranes. G surface already mentioned, the gyroid in butterfly, birds, and shrews to name a few. The P surface, the P is short for primitive because it's a very simple surface. I think anyway that's what it stands for and why. We can find this in algae and in the calcite skeletons of some sea urchins. Which brings us back to the ICD, the Institute of Computational Design and Construction, because they did explore this kind of double curvature inspired by the calcite skeleton of this sea urchin, arriving at a shape similar to the P surface for this pavilion. There's a lot more to this pavilion than this shape, but this is another example of how these ideas can be translated to architecture specifically. We'll be looking at all these shapes and several more. These surfaces are really beautiful examples, and they give us a really nice way to explore how math manifests in nature. How, when each basic part of a system is following some relatively simple rules from the collective of their interactions, something beautiful emerges. These surfaces give us an uncomplicated example of this. Think of this quote by D.R.C. Thompson. One common law is obeyed by every point or particle on the system, even though the underlying equations are unknown to us. This beauty is itself sometimes revealing the underlying truths. Computational design can help us work with this inherent beauty in nature. And so with this tutorial, maybe we can scratch the surface. First, we're going to make a lookup table, a lookup table of meshes based on eight Boolean values. These are going to be the eight vertices of a cube. Then we're going to calculate the values at points in three-dimensional space. We're going to use equations related to the curvature of different periodic minimal surfaces as a way to calculate values for different points in a three-dimensional space. It's easiest to do at normal increments, like a cubic grid, 
and that's why we're making a Boolean lookup table for the eight vertices of a cube. Then with our point values and our lookup table, we can place meshes inside every cube as if we've divided up a whole three-dimensional space into little cubes. And we're going to visit each cube and decide whether or not a mesh goes into that cube, and if so, which mesh. We're just going to step from one cube to the next until we visited every cube in our three-dimensional space, thus the term marching cubes. And at first, this mesh is going to be a little jagged, so our next step will be to interpolate the vertices of each mesh to better match the actual values in our three-dimensional space. And then from there, we can refine the mesh a little bit and explore what it looks like in different locations. So, let's dive in. 